Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight we'll get a recap of Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to Washington, uh, the APAC conference, and the GOP candidates' positions on Israel and Iran with JTA Washington Bureau Chief Ron Campius. Then we'll look at how the 2012 presidential race is shaping up with Shane uh, Debril. He's the editor of Campaigns and Elections magazine. Uh, but first, a discussion uh, on Iran. I want to welcome Barbara Slavin, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council specializing on Iran. and the, She's also Washington correspondent for AL Monitor, former senior diplomatic reporter for USA Today and author of the book Bitter Friends and Bosom Enemies, Iran, the U.S. and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Now, you've been on the show in your other capacities, but AL Monitor is new. And tell it's me a little about monitor. it. It's All Monitor. All. All Monitor. As okay. in the Arabic, okay. all. Tell me <laughs> about it. Um, um, it's a new venture, started a month ago. It uh, is a combination of stories that are translated from Arabic, Turkish, and Hebrew from local newspapers. They're professionally translated and professionally copy edited. We look for articles that you will not see uh, on some of the other translation sites that people have to pay money for. So it's quite interesting. And then we have original content. Uh, I write a couple of columns a week, and we have also guest uh, columnists. Uh, and Iran has been a big topic lately, so has Syria, you can imagine. So tell me a little about the articles, the, the original content. You said that Trita Parsi, who's been a guest on this show, mm -hmm. Trita uh, just did done, a piece, and, and I you've did. done some interviews with some pretty. Yeah, I've interviewed Chuck Hagel and Spigner Brzezinski and Marie Slaughter, the former uh, policy yeah. planning director uh, for Hillary Clinton. Uh, the piece that I just did uh, is about a kind of change in tone with Iran, which actually dates to Obama's comments before APEC. That was what really signaled, I think, the beginning of a change in tone. I want to talk about that in a minute, but um, I want to start with the elections. But sure. AL Monitor, I'll, I'll monitor. monitor. I'm saying AL Monitor because when we started the conversation, um, yeah. I thought it was A1 Monitor because no, no. when I looked at the, the, the print, <laughs> I didn't quite get it. Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera, uh, Al Monitor. I, 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 I get it. <laughs> okay, I get it. Okay, okay. you're Arab. So you're you, you Arab, said you no, AL it. Monitor, and I've been repeating that. <laughs> okay, I, I'll monitor. It's new, it's and, new, it's, brand and new. it's worth going to. It's uh, for people who don't want to have to pay money to get news from the region that's translated for them, well translated. And, uh, and plus some really good original content. Yeah, I think they should I want take to talk look. about the elections in Iran. Sure. Um, most Americans would be confounded by the statement that the conservatives won and Ahmadinejad lost. <laughs> uh, that's been repeated now a number of times. The hardliners won and the president lost. I explain what that means. All right, first of all, conservative hardliner, these, these are m almost meaningless terms now in Iran. Let's look at where we are. The supreme leader of the country, uh, who is a cleric, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, first endorsed Ahmadinejad in 2009 for his reelection. You remember, he called it a divine assessment, and he cracked down on ref the reform movement. He put the two other presidential candidates under house arrest. Lots of people were jailed, people were killed. Uh, he was best buddies with Ahmadinejad then, but uh, Ahmadinejad tried to take advantage of this, and he pushed his own uh, personal powers too far. And he had a big confrontation with the Supreme Leader last uh, April when he tried to fire the intelligence minister and was forced to reinstate the intelligence minister. This is not about ideology. This is about power. This is about who gets to run the Islamic Republic of Iran, who gets to control its diminishing resources. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about sanctions and so on in a bit if you want. So that's what it's about. And a uh, big fight between the leader and the president. This is tension between the leader and president. We've seen this before with Hatemi, with Rafsanjani, but it, it got really bad with Ahmadinejad. So in these uh, parliamentary elections, first of all, most of the reformists couldn't run, and a lot of people stayed home. They said 64% turned out. Not so. It was, you know, if they got 50%, they were lucky. Um, so they inflated the figures. They disqualified uh, pretty much everybody connected with Ahmadinejad. So, you know, the only people who won were those who had pledged fealty to the Supreme Leader. But this is Iran. These people do not get along with each other. So even the so-called loyalists of the Supreme Leader split into 11 different tickets mm -hmm. <laughs> in Tehran. You know, we won't know until the new parliament seats exactly what its orientation will be. 
there will be jousting over who gets to be the speaker, you know, and uh, and there will be differences over policies. That's what makes Iranian politics so interesting. But is the that supreme it's leader remains contentious the, in, in charge. The supreme leader is as is more in charge than he's ever been. So we will not see. But He's also more isolated than he's ever been. Will there be a change in policy on any significant issue? I'm Whether hoping. it be yeah, I'm hoping. Iran in the Gulf yeah. or Iran in Lebanon or Iran on the nuclear question. I'm hoping particularly on the nuclear question. I think there are a couple reasons for that. Hamenei can now declare victory because the elections are safely passed. There was a huge security presence. There were no incidents, no demonstrations, no violence. So he'll declare victory. Uh, the other factor are, is these uh, draconian economic sanctions, which are crushing the Iranian economy. They're, uh, just uh, today, new, new banking restrictions have gone into effect. Basically, Iranian banks are excommunicated from the international banking system. You cannot do a bank transaction. Uh, a foreign bank cannot do a transaction with Iran. Very, very, very difficult. So uh, this is cutting into Iranian oil earnings. They can't get paid in hard currency. They're resorting to barter. They've asked to be paid in gold in some cases. Suitcases of cash are going across the border. They're smuggling oil out to you know, Iraq and trying to get it out that way. It's a big mess. And I think that the leader has been sending signals that he is ready to deal. And Obama has been sending signals mm -hmm. That he's ready I want to, to get deal. to that in a minute, but I want to continue on the internal Iranian situation and ask you about the reform movement. Is it finished? No, absolutely not. And just uh, yesterday, the Supreme Leader did something very interesting. Uh, I, uh, Rafsanjani, Hashemi Rafsanjani, the former president, he has lost every single position he had in the establishment except for one. Yesterday, the Supreme Leader reappointed him to another five-year term as head of something called the Expediency Council. This is a body that's supposed to mediate disputes within the government. In fact, it's toothless. But this was a sign that the Supreme Leader felt it necessary to hold on to Rafsanjani and to try to broaden his base just a little bit. And Rafsanjani is a very popular figure among many people who are considered pragmatists and, and also among some of the reformists. So a lot of the American... May, may I, may I, one other thing, yeah. too. Uh, people are looking to see whether the two reform uh, candidates, Mousavi and Karubi, are released from house arrest before the Iranian New Year, or around the time of the Iranian mm -hmm. New Year, which, as you know, is the is March 21. One of the things that the Supreme Leader has said is that, that not has said, but it's it's suggested that he wants to do away with the presidency and make it a parliamentary system. Um, that would even further consolidate his power. Yeah. And it, how likely is it that that occur? Not clear. I mean, I think that's partly a threat to sort of put Ahmadinejad in his place. Uh, Ahmadinejad was summoned by parliament and questioned uh, very uh, severely uh, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe he'll be impeached. It, it depends on who the possible candidates are for president and how much the leader feels that he's in control of the situation. The talk uh, After the last election, uh, and I'd say before that election, so much of the focus was on Ahmadinejad. Actually, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton was appealing to the Supreme Leader, uh, you know, that he's taking control, et cetera. Um, but uh, it, it now appears that he wasn't in control of the Revolutionary he's never been Guard. In control. That he no. wasn't in control of the thugs who were doing the beating up and the, 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 the crackdown on demonstrators. Um, and so, what is his fate now? Well, first of all, he, he has, he, he's implicated in what happened in 2009 because the Interior Ministry answers to him. Yeah. And the Interior Ministry was the ministry that, that uh, committed the but fraud. But this wasn't an independent operation that he controlled. You know, he amassed more power and more attention than many previous Iranian okay. presidents. Okay. So I think we have to say that he took the powers that he had and he used them to the hilt. Mm -hmm. He pushed way outside uh, you know, the envelope on this, and that was one of the reasons why the leader had to rein him in. But by and large, uh, he was saying things that the leader wanted him to say, and uh, certainly his confrontational attitude about Israel and so on was very much in keeping with the leader's views. Uh, but the leader has always been in control. He is, is, he now he is lame, the Supreme is Leader. Is he now a lame duck? He's been a lame duck since 2009. With, but, but between now and the election? Completely. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he can still cause trouble. He knows the dirty secrets of the Islamic Republic. If he wants to open those files, he could. And that's one reason why I think he won't be impeached. He'll be allowed to serve out his term. But, 
but the power base he wanted to create that would, like Putin, no, sort of no, put no. him in a That's position. Gone. That's, That's gone. gone. That's gone. Netanyahu and Obama, the, the interesting meeting that they had and the sort of the dueling speeches at APEC that people played out one way or another. I want to ask you about both of those, but first I want to go to the end of the story. Did they end up on the same page? Was there an mm -hmm. agreement or, or, or was there not? There was a truce. <laughs> yeah. Not really an agreement. No, they don't really agree. But Obama was very clever. He embraced Netanyahu. Yeah. He said, we feel your pain. And then he read him the riot act and said, you will not attack Iran. Yeah. You will not do this. Not while I'm running for re-election, not while we have other options. You will not do this. And uh, it was very interesting, the speech that Netanyahu gave to APEC, while it was full of the usual Holocaust references and, and the other sort of melodramatic shtick that he always goes through, uh, he said the United States and Iran are on the same page. Uh, sorry, so the United States and Israel are on the same page when it comes to Iran. And he downplayed the differences between them. Even, and he also, he didn't talk about Iranian nuclear capability. He talked about nuclear weapons. And this is the red line that Obama set, that Iran may not uh, develop nuclear weapons. Not that it can't develop a nuclear capability, because frankly, Iran already has a nuclear weapons capability. So I think that uh, Bibi bowed to the reality that Obama is more and more likely to be reelected to another term. And he, uh, he, was a, he was a different Bibi with Obama. He was not as contentious. He was not as disrespectful as he's been in the past. Um, a return to negotiations. Is it serious? Uh, we had Trita Parsi on just recently mm -hmm. um, talking about the several rounds that preceded and the fainting this way and fainting that way and, mm -hmm. and dithering until there was, uh, and meandering until it was too late and then nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an outcome possible at this point? Well, you know, it, it, it depends on, on both sides. It depends on whether the Iranians are really feeling the heat. I think they are. And it depends on whether the United States and its uh, partners are willing to put forward some kind of face-saving proposal that would acknowledge Iran's right to enrich uranium, but would cap the program. This is all about playing for time. This is not about solving the problem. But if you can simply provide confidence that Iran is not going to build a nuclear weapon in the next year or two or three or four, you know, that gives time for diplomacy, it gives time for internal dynamics in Iran to play out, and it dampens all this ridiculous talk of war. So I think that's the objective. And Obama's comments really for the first time gave me some hope that, to paraphrase uh, Trita, this is not just a single roll of the dice, that we might see another roll of the dice. Uh, and and a, you know, a serious effort uh, at trying to, uh, to negotiate at least uh, some confidence-building measures. So Obama won by not giving in to the new red line that Netanyahu wanted to introduce. Right. And won by possibly putting the Israelis on notice that a military strike wouldn't, uh, wouldn't occur. Um, yet Netanyahu goes home and declares victory. Well, of course, he's a great politician. And you have to give credit to Netanyahu. His hysteria about Iran has helped produce the most draconian sanctions against the Islamic Republic in 33 years. Uh, I did a piece, uh, not for Al Monitor, before I joined Al Monitor for Interpress Service on why the Europeans agreed to an oil embargo. And the main reason they agreed is that they, are, they were terrified that Israel would start another Middle East war which would send the price of oil sky high and, and send Europe back into, into recession. And so they figured that the lesser of two evils was to impose a, an oil embargo on Iran. There have been talk of new inspections in Iran and mm -hmm. discussions as to what those inspections would uh, entail, whether the Iranians would allow a military site. Is, that a, is the, the military site in question a deal breaker? The Iranians said at first uh, yes, and then now are saying no. I don't think no. so, frankly. No. I mean, the Iranians have been playing a cat and mouse game with the International Atomic Energy Agency for years. The, what's key is that they stop enriching uranium, uranium at 20 percent U-235, that they cap it at 5 percent, and that they stop or slow the enrichment at a site called Fordo, which is deep in a mountain near Qum. Uh, which is very, very difficult for anybody to, to attack. I think those are the two key things. If they do that, that, you know, everybody will give a collective sigh of relief. Now, there's a question, what will we offer in return? Fuel for their reactor that produces medical isotopes? 
fine, but I think the U.S. should also offer to hold off on some of these sanctions. Maybe the Europeans could continue to buy some Iranian oil. Maybe some of these banking sanctions could be uh, could be eased just a little bit if the Iranians agree to to do this. Does this occur in the midst of an American election? Of course it does, and that makes it harder for Obama to make concessions. But you know, one can see a win-win here. I mean, it's not hard to see. And again, I was struck that Obama is feeling more confident now. I think about the elections. I think uh, he's he said to you know Israel supporters in this country, I will not allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. You know, and the military option is still on the table. So I think that gives him a little more leeway. Also, because the Republicans are in such disarray, gives him a little more leeway to uh, to make some decent offers. We'll see. We'll see what the U.S. offers, we'll see what the Iranians are willing to do. And the, the Arab side, which feels left out of this discussion uh, all too often, hmm. uh, wh what, uh, where do they fit into this or not fit into this? Well, I think they would be relieved if there's not another war. You know, I mean, the brunt of this might really fall on them. The Iranians might attack Saudi oil fields, attack tanker traffic in the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. So I think even though they would love, uh, one side of their brain would love to see a, you know, a massive strike on Iran's nuclear facilities, I think the other more rational side says, no, we want this crisis to be contained. So we have three sets of elections possibly occurring. The U.S. ones, the Israelis are moving in that direction, and the Iranians, if they do have a presidential election, would be mm -hmm. uh, a, a year out. Um, even with all of that, you are seeing a convergence of some positive forces. I am. I mean, with a proviso that the Iranians could get lucky, they could assassinate an Israeli ambassador somewhere. We've just seen, of course, some people arrested in Azerbaijan, yeah. New Delhi, other places. You know, that sort of thing might, might start up this whole war talk again. Now, we should be aware of the fact that the Israelis have been bumping off Iranian uh, scientists for the last few years. and and doing other heinous things to Iran. So there's a question of whether the covert war, the shadow war, can be also contained or whether that's going to break into some incident. You'll remember very well, I'm sure, that the Israelis invaded uh, Lebanon in, uh, in uh, 1982 after there was an attempt uh, by uh, not even the PLO, mm -hmm. but another Palestinian group against the Israeli ambassador in, in London. So, you know, there could always be some Revolutionary Guard cowboy in, in, in the Persian Gulf who decides he wants to attack an American ship. I know for a fact that U.S. military authorities are working very assiduously to prevent any kind of escalation. They have a whole series of contingencies to try to contain any incident that might happen like that to prevent it from going all the way up into, into something massive. But, you know, the Iranians have to behave as well. and. They're under a lot of pressure, uh, and you know one can't be entirely sure. But last last couple of weeks since Obama and Netanyahu at, at APEC, um, I have felt, frankly, that we have we've gotten over a certain crisis. I don't know if it's going to produce peace in our time, but I don't think an it's going to produce take, another war. An interesting take on the APEC yeah, speech, I, which I think was, me. <laughs> was not the take certainly in the Arab world, which looked literally at too much of the speech and said, you know, they're in each other's hip pocket. And I think it's an interesting one. No, Thank you for that. Not at all. I mean, you have to read those speeches, yeah. but there were differences, certainly, but uh, oh, uh, Netanyahu was careful not to cross Obama's red lines. On I actually thought last, uh, and I said on the last show that I thought the most interesting thing was what happened the day after mm -hmm. at the press conference that yeah. Obama did when he put down his Republican opponents uh, for too cavalierly speaking about going to war. I thought that was one of the most dramatic statements of I am the commander in chief that I'd heard from a president in a long time. Yeah, it was, it was very welcome when he condemned the loose talk of war, yeah. when he talked of the almost casual way in which uh, the yeah. Republican candidates, apart from Ron Paul, yeah. have talked about starting another war, when he talked about uh, the, he said the most searing moments in his presidency had been when he had to meet yeah. the families of those killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Americans. And yeah, I thought, you know, he's the president. I mean, he kind of rose, yeah. uh, rose up to that, uh, that level. And uh, the Republicans, at least so far, are not able to, to challenge him on that. Thank you for this. this was, uh, it was an enlightening conversation. I appreciated it. When we come back, we'll talk about this topic further 
with Jewish Telegraphic Agency Washington Bureau Chief Ron Campius and look at the Israeli and American Jewish reaction to the same issues. Uh, we'll be right back.